Emily, thanks. Yep. Oh, Charlie, thank you so much. It, it's such a privilege to be able to serve both the Club EvMed and, and the, the wider audience in terms of evolutionary medicine. So thank you so much. Um, wow, it's a real pleasure being somebody myself who began with kind of wildlife ecology more broadly and then moved into cancer, having three really amazing, um, at least to me when you're an old guy, young up and coming a super bright scientist speaking to us on PETA's paradox today on why cancer risk doesn't scale with lifespan. And so we have we have three folks. We've got uh, Orsha Vinci um, from the Center for Ecological Research um, in Hungary. Um, her background is a lot of avian ecology, physiology, morphology, behavior, sexual selection, ecology of birds, some with mammals. I'm having done some of her education in Romania, PhD in Debrecen University in Hungary. Um, and in working kind of towards immunology in birds, um, I believe then the next person I'll introduce was then Matthew Giraudot, um, was part of the connection and inspiration for some of her ongoing interest in Pito's paradox. And, and Matthew, introducing him, is at Low Rochelle University, um, not far from here. Uh, where I am currently right now in Marseille. Um, he did his PhD in Toulouse University. And Matthew, again, has a really broad and exciting background. And I suspect, Matthew, my, you know, your success, your broad thinking, the amazing ways you can connect the dots must come from the fact that um, already he has worked in labs in the United States, Switzerland, Australia, UK, and Exeter, and blends evolutionary ecology and cancer biology as well as having everything from urban ecology, avian ecology, disease transmission, climate change, and then dealing with cancer risk across mammals, the exciting paper that Orsha and Matthew recently published. And then finally, uh, we're privileged to have Alex Kagan from the Welcome Sanger Institute here. And Alex, I apologize. I don't know where you got your PhD from. I was having so much fun uh, looking at your work, but Alex's work uh, begins with in the tradition of Jane Goodall, primatology that grew from primatology into phylogenies, evolutionary ecology of primates, emphasis on great apes, leading to studies in human genetic diversity. I really like including associations with domestic animals, spread of domestic animals by using their genes. And I think a lot of that presumably it sounds like led to really good work on somatic mutations, aging, and now cancer initiation as well as then the wonderful paper we got to see um, from this year, somatic mutation rates scaled with lifespan across mammals. So all three of you, thank you very, very much. And uh, Orisha, if you, if you would like to begin, I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for Club FMED for the invitation to give this talk. So I'm going to present our latest nature paper in which we try to gather information on cancer risk in different mammalian species. And we try to analyze and see what influences cancer risk in different animal species. So at first, what is cancer? So we know that cancer is not a single disease, but rather a group of diseases which share a common feature that some cells in the body start to grow and proliferate uncontrollably. Sometimes they form solid tumors, and at some point they can start to spread to distant tissues and uh, organs in the, in the body of the host organism, often causing the death of the, of the host. We know also that cancer is a genetic disease, meaning that it's caused by alterations in the genes that control the, the functioning, the, the growth or proliferation of these cells. And we also know that it's not a single mutation that causes cancer, but rather a combination of mutations that, uh, that can emerge at some point during life, and these alter the behavior of the cells. Most of the mutations emerge at cell divisions. This is important because the double-stranded DNA is highly stable, but when cells divide, the two strands are separated, and at this stage, the DNA is extremely uh, prone to damages, both from mutagenic agents as well as from simple copy error mutations that emerge. So, for instance, in, in humans, the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs. Given that we are diploid organisms, this means that about 6 billion base pairs have to be copied nucleotide by nucleotide every time a cell divides in our body. While the fidelity of this copying mechanism is extremely high, there are some errors that occur during this copying. So in one, during, uh, one in 100,000 base pairs, there is a 
copying error, which is most often eliminated immediately by some proofreading and DNA repair mechanisms. And even if not, there is a high chance that cells that carry these mutations will be uh, identified by the immune system and will be destroyed before they can cause any harm. But even though these mechanisms almost ensure almost perfect DNA replication, there are some mutations that can slip through all these mechanisms and become permanent mutations uh, in cell lineages. And cell divisions are important because this does not only mean that the zygote has to divide about 30 trillion times the number of cells that a human adult body is composed of, but we also know that cells in our bodies have a limited lifespan. We know that red blood cells only live about four months, skin epithelial cells about two, three weeks, while colon epithelial cells live about four days. This means that the cells have to divide again and again in our bodies to keep our body functional. So this means that as we go through life, we, we have to go through more and more cell divisions and each cell division brings a small chance of generating mutations. And with each, the number of mutations that we carry has to increase in, in cell lineages. Most of the, the mutations can happen anytime during our lives. So pro, first, from the first cleavage of the zygote until very old ages, they can happen basically anytime. And while most mutations are completely harmless, they are silent and they do not cause any kind of change in the behavior or the phenotype of these cells, sometimes as we go through life, there is a higher and higher chance that some mutations will actually influence the proliferation rate of these cells. And at some point they can generate cancer. And this is important because this is exactly why we believe that um, cancer is so rare at younger ages. And this is exactly why most cancer cases are emerging at older ages. So as we go through life, there is more and more mutations accumulating in our bodies, and there is a higher chance that cancer will emerge. And a similar logic is behind the size association of cancer risk. So for instance, in humans, we know that every 10 centimeter increase in body height is precipitating in an increased risk of cancer. This applies both to women and men, and also to dogs where cancer was quite well studied. So it seems that within species, um, a combined effect of body size and lifespan is precipitating an increased risk of cancer. So what happens if we look at across species and if we suggest that all cells in all animal species have the same propensity to, to develop cancer? We would expect that larger long-lived organisms such as an elephant or a guava whale would have much more cancer than smaller bodied species such as a mice or a shrew. But if we look at empirical data, we will see that this is not quite the, the, quite the case. So for instance, in humans, um, the risk of cancer is approximately the same as in a mice, but humans have a much larger body size and a much longer lifespan than mice. So it seems that there is a discrepancy in the association between body size or lifespan and cancer risk across or within species. And this is a paradox, first noted by Sir Richard Pito, a British epidemiologist. And the paradox is basically named after him, Pito's paradox. And the paradox is extremely important because if it's really true, and it applies to all vertebrate organisms or across species, it would mean that large lived, large bodied, long lived organisms somehow solved the problem of carcinogenesis. It would mean that large, long lived animal species actually have a lower mutation rate or a higher resistance against these cancerous mutations. So somehow they solve this problem that we face basically. And this has massive implications for medical sciences because it, it would mean that we only have to look at these organisms, identify the molecular or cellular mechanisms behind this, and maybe we could find some biological cure to cancer that is non-toxic to the host organisms. But first we have to prove that the paradox is actually true. And to do so, we have to gather information on cancer from various organisms. And while we know very well now that cancer occurs in virtually every animal species, from mammals to reptiles, from birds to fish, we have very limited data on the risk of cancer from wild organisms. This is probably because sick animals uh, quickly die of starvation or predation, become, they become weak and they die quite quickly before 
the disease could be identified in the wild. The age association of cancer risk makes this even more complicated. We know that with, with age, the risk of cancer increases a lot. So if I go into nature and capture 100 random individuals and I do not see cancer in them, it might be because I capture two young individuals where the cancer is unlikely to happen, or it could be also because the species is highly resistant to cancer. So to identify the risk of cancer in the wild, I need populations where individuals are marked and monitored throughout life, which is very difficult. But we really wanted to test Peter's paradox. So we turned to zoo animals because zoos keep quite well uh, records of their animals. And even in zoos, the data quality is quite heterogeneous. So to limit this heterogeneity, we tried to focus um, our attention to the most recent 10 years of data. So we excluded any animal species that were rec recorded in this database before 2010. We only focused on sexually mature individuals and we also excluded domesticated animals because they might be affected by some uh, inbreeding effect or, or different um, uh, biasing factors. After these exclusions, we ended up with 110,148 individual mammals belonging to 191 species. Some of these individuals were alive, some were dead. But for all, we knew the, the date of birth. And for those diseased, we knew the cause of that and the date of that. And the cause of that included cancer. No data on the type of cancer, but uh, only whether they died of cancer or not. So using this information, we estimated the risk of cancer mortality using two metrics. First, we estimated cancer prevalence, which was basically the number of individuals that died of cancer divided by the number of individuals whose cause of death was registered in the database. This is a very simple measure of disease risk um, in this population, and it still doesn't control for age effect. So to validate this metric, we also calculated cumulative incidence of cancer at 90% adult longevity. This is the age when 90% of the adult population is already dead. And this is controlled for, for age effects and it's controlled for censoring that we see in our data. And the two metrics were very highly correlated in our database, probably because we used captive animals. So premature deaths in this population is quite rare because animals receive medical care and quite a bit of attention throughout their lives. So I'm not going to separate the two metrics from now on. They, they provided the same results all through. And we also estimated longevity. We estimated adult life expectancy based on the information that we received from zoo animals. And we also uh, gathered information from bod on body mass in, in these species. So first of all, the phylogenetic distribution of the data. As you can see, um, we showed that cancer is basically omnipresent across the mammalian phylogeny. So it's really present in carnivores, in bats, in primates, in rodents, in ungulates, basically everywhere across the mammalian phylogeny. And in some species, about 60% of the adults die of cancer. So it seems to be a quite significant cause of mortality in these species. What was also striking from this graph is that um, cancer risk shows a marked phylogenetic effect. So for instance, in carnivora, most species faced quite high cancer risk. Why, for instance, in ungulates, many species had zero cancer risk, despite quite uh, considerate sample sizes in these uh, taxa. This is also apparent from the medians of the orders. You can see that um, carnivorous animals have a much larger median cancer mortality risk than any other mammalian order, and artiodactyla, so ungulates, have a particularly uh, low risk of cancer across all mammals. So our first question was unrelated to our original idea of testing Peter's paradox. Why do carnivorous animals have so much cancer? And we tested, uh, well, there are two hypotheses in the literature that were very prominent. One is bioaccumulation, which means that because they consume a lot of animal products, uh, car carcinogenic effects or carcinogenic compounds can bioaccumulate up the food chains and making carnivorous animals more prone to cancer. And the other factor could be oncogenic viruses because these species consume a lot of raw animal products and they can be infected by oncogenic viruses. So to test these two hypotheses, we gathered information 
about the diet of these animals. In each end diet item, we actually categorize all species. If they do not consume these food items or they do consume these food items, and we show that consuming vertebrates and particularly mammalian prey is associated with increased risk of cancer compared to those species that do not consume these food items. So based on this, we think that the oncogenic virus hypothesis is the most likely scenario because virus transmission is most likely to happen in a mammal to mammal scenario. But of course, this hypothesis needs to be further explored for, for testing what is actually behind the elevated risk of cancer in carnivorous animals. And then we tested Peter's paradox. So first we tested how cancer mortality relates to body mass. And here, of course, we expected a positive association. So with larger bodied species having much more cancer than smaller bodied species. But contrary to our expectations, we actually found a slight negative association that was very far from being significant. So it really seems that larger bodied species do not face higher risk of cancer than smaller bodied species. And then we tested the longevity hypothesis, whether adult life expectancy is correlated with cancer risk. And we show that although there is a small increase in cancer risk with increasing adult longevity, the increase is really minor compared to uh, the scale of life expectancy difference in our database. So it really seems that Peter was right and Peter's paradox is true and evolution has solved the problem of carcinogenesis. And the question is, what is behind this? So what is the mechanism? What is the cure of cancer uh, by evolution? Could it be vegetarianism? Uh, of course, we see many large body species like elephants or mammoths or giraffes that are all herbivores, but there are large body species like sharks that are carnivorous and they still do not face a lot of cancer. Could it be increased genomic stability? And Alex will talk about it quite a bit. But there are some hypotheses out there stating that tumor suppressor genes can be duplicated, meaning that the genome stability can be better maintained uh, in larger long-lived species than in smaller species or short-lived species. Or could it be also um, increased resistance to mutations? So for instance, if harmful mutations might emerge, then immune system might take uh, action and identify and destroy uh, cells that carry these harmful mutations. So these are all hypotheses that need to be explored and I'm really looking forward to Alex's talk to talk more about the mutations behind these effects. And thank you very much for your attention. And I thank all my coaches for the help with this work. Portia, thank you very, very much. That was really a dynamite description and characterization, as well as updated analyses on PETO's paradox. We'll wait for questions for your material when we kind of hit the, the, the discussion period. So Alex, please, if you're all set to go, that would be great. Yeah, great. Um, let me just share my screen. Is that working for you guys? Looks great. Alex, Brilliant. thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think yeah, I'm really happy to be pairing these two presentations together because I think there's a lot of interesting synergies to discuss. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a staff scientist at the Sanger Welcome, uh, Welcome Sanger Institute, uh, and I'll be talking about results from our recent paper about somatic mutation rates across mammalian species. Uh, and the previous presentation has done a great job of introducing a lot of the topics. So I can whiz through quite a few slides. Um, but yeah, just so we're all on the same page, we're fascinated with the topic of somatic mutation. So these are the mutations that our cells accumulate in our body throughout the course of our lifetime. Uh, and these mutations originate from DNA damage, which can be caused by a variety of endogenous or exogenous sources. Fortunately, as, been, as has been discussed, most of this damage is repaired, but not all of it is. And that leads to mu mutations accumulating in the cells of our body as we age. And as those cells divide, it means that those mutations are kind of spreading throughout the body in little clonal patches. So as a result, as we age, we become these molecular mosaics as these little clonal expansions occur where DNA damage occurs in a cell, there's a mutation, that cell divides and those mutations spread locally, spatially within the body. And just another way of looking at that, uh, a kind of a bit more scientific way is here's some epithelial skin and you can see colored in these patches of cells where one cell has a mutation, it's divided and, and spread that mutation throughout the epithelium. And then on the right-hand side, you can see how you know, this process increases with aging 
but also if you're exposed to external mutagens from sunlight or alcohol or tobacco, that can also accelerate this process. Um, and and as, been, as has been mentioned, you know, this is one of the ways in which you know, cancer occurs is you get these mutations occurring in important functional regions in the genome, and that leads to kind of over proliferation and carcinogenesis. Um, and so kind of just one slide to briefly talk about you know, years of work that's been going on at the Sanger and, and other institutes around the world. We've been on this journey to kind of uh, characterize somatic mutation rates and processes across the human body in healthy tissue before carcinogenesis to kind of understand how mutations occur in the body in different cell types. And what we've discovered, primarily using methods like laser capture microscopy, where we can take tissue samples, microdissect out different groups of cells and sequence them, is that these mutational processes vary tissue to tissue. So you have some variation in the types of mutational process, the rates at which these processes operate. So you have very different mutation rates from cell type to cell type. Uh, but most of this work is focused on humans uh, for pretty good reasons, but we think there's also excellent reasons to take a wider comparative approach and to take these methods and apply them to other species to learn more about processes of somatic mutation and somatic evolution in other species. Uh, and you know, with the, one of the key reasons that's already been addressed and we're talking about today is Peter's paradox. And I, you know, I, I don't need to go over this again, but we think it's a, a fascinating way to address this question and look at maybe one of the solutions is to address whether there are different somatic mutation rates in different species. Because if one of the solutions to Peter's paradox is just lowering the mutation rate, which seems like quite a sensible solution. You know, if you have more cells and you're living longer, one way to reduce your cancer risk is just to have a slower rate at which those mutations occur. So you're, it's gonna take longer to knock out those important genes. But to address this question, we need to generate that data and see like, does a whale have a lower mutation rate than a mouse? Um, another question we're interested in is the aging question. So we, we know that species age at very different rates. Uh, we think aging is probably a multifactorial process, but you know, one of the processes that we think could be involved is somatic mutation. So could this accumulation of somatic mutations in cells over time not just lead to potentially to cancer, but could also have a role in kind of degenerating the function of cells and leading to contributing to the aging process? Um, so essentially, you could say, uh, you know, it's our cancer and aging two sides of the same coin where they're both caused by this accumulation of somatic mutations over time. And that's a question we really wanted to address, uh, but we needed kind of the data to do it. So for this study, our objective was to actually generate some data to quantify the somatic mutation rate across different species. Uh, and then to test once we had this data, whether we could explain any of the variation we saw uh, by looking at the different lifespans, body sizes, or other traits that vary between species. Uh, so to do this, we work with a variety of partners around the UK to collect tissue samples from 16 different mammalian species. We were very interested in kind of trying to find species that would enable us to disentangle the role of different variables. So, you know, lifespan and body size are usually correlated uh, in mammals, and we, and we focused on mammals for this study. Um, but we were very happy to have species like the naked mole rat that have a very long lifespan, but a very small body size to help us try and disentangle what were potentially the causative variables. Uh, and so to do this work, we kind of leveraged a pipeline that we developed for human studies where we can take a tissue sample and then we do a histological preparation. So we kind of section it onto microscope slides, uh, but they're special microscope slides with a plastic membrane that enables us to use laser capture microscopy. So we can actually cut around small groups of cells, take them off the slide, extract the DNA and sequence them. And then we can kind of look at the number of somatic mutations in small microanatomical structures. Um, and because from the human work, we knew that the mutation rate can vary from cell type to cell type, we knew we wanted to look at the same cell type across species to kind of control that variable. And um, we decided on intestinal crypts, uh, one, because all mammals have them, uh, but also because uh, they, there's something nice about them that helps us to identify somatic mutations. So ideally, if we could, we would just take a single cell from you know, each animal, sequence it and count the number of somatic mutations. But for technical reasons, because the error rate is too high in single cell sequencing, that doesn't work very well. There are too many errors in the sequencing. But with intestinal crypts, you, kind of, you have a basal stem cell that's rapidly proliferating every couple of days. So all of the kind of cells lining the wall of this crypt will share the mutations that have been accumulating over the lifetime of that animal in the stem cell. So if you micro dissect out the entire crypt and sequence all the cells, and look for the mutations that are shared by all of those cells, you kind of get uh, essentially the mutation rate of that basal stem cell. So it's a kind of a way for us to solve that technical challenge. And yeah, so the way I alluded to that we do that is laser capture microdissection. Now you sit at the lab uh, with a Wacom tablet, you can, under the microscope, you can draw on the screen around the cells you wanna capture and it will then cut them out for you. Uh, and here's just kind of a quick video demonstrating how that process looks like. 
Uh, this isn't actually from an intestinal crypt. This is from a seminiferous tubule from a dog um, from the Chernobyl uh, exclusion zone, which is another a project we're looking at. But again, this is kind of the laser is cutting around the tissue and the membrane so we can isolate specific uh, microanatomical structures. And sometimes due to static, the, the tissue doesn't fall off the slides. You use a wider aperture laser beam and essentially laser catapult it off of the slide into the tube beneath it. Um, so th this is kind of just a quick example of what these colonic crypts or intestinal crypts looked like across all the species. All mammals, quite similar structures, and we were able to microdissect uh, individual ones. And here's an example of that just on the left and the right, you can see a crypt has been removed through laser capture microdissection. Um, and so we could generate sequence data from each of these individual crypts. Uh, we took multiple crypts per animal, and where we could, we took multiple animals per species. And for this talk and for the paper, we just focused on single base substitutions or insertions and deletions. So small single base changes like a C to a T rather than these larger scale structural changes, which are a bit harder to identify, especially when you have reference genomes of different quality. And so kind of just summarizing the initial data, we have 208 intestinal crypts, which we sequence to about 30x coverage each, so 30 times genome coverage. And then on, on kind of panel B here, you can just see the number of mutations we saw per genome. Uh, across the different species and the kind of the, it, it changes in shade of blue depending on the animal and you can see very different kind of mutation uh, burdens per animal and per species and that's partly because we had animals of different ages and we know that as you age you accumulate more mutations and indeed uh, in panel c at the bottom you can see this kind of linear accumulation of mutations with age in these species where we had multiple uh, animals of different ages which reassured us that the variants that we were identifying were probably true somatic mutations to explain this clear linear pattern that we saw. So that gave us confidence to continue with analyzing the data. Um, and something really nice that we can do with genomic data now, apart from just counting the number of mutations, is that we know that different mutational processes tend to cause, uh, kind of occur in different regions of the genome, particularly uh, with regards to the trinucleotide spectra. So when a mutation happens, you know, it happens between two other existing nucleotides, uh, and certain mutational processes will have a, a preponderance to occur in certain patterns. And so you can take your genome data and then you can kind of extract and understand which different mutational processes contributed to the mutations that you're seeing. And so here you can see, for example, uh, on the top UV damage and on the bottom smoking tend to cause different types of mutations, C to T's on the top and C to A's on the bottom. And then kind of each bar represents a different trinucleotide context where that's occurring. And what that enables us to do is to look at these mutations that we see in the intestinal crypts of different animals and try and understand, you know, are they being caused by the same underlying mutational processes? So for example, uh, the top here are the mutations we find in a, a lion, uh, sorry, a tiger crypt. And we see that this pattern is very similar to a process that we've seen in humans, which is the spontaneous deamination of 5-methylcytosine at CPG. So does that, the process isn't so important, just to, to bear in mind that this is an endogenous process that we see throughout the human body and particularly in the human intestine. So showing that the kind of, at least in a tiger, the same kind of mutational processes seem to be occurring that are causing these mutations as we've seen in human. And when we look across all the species, we indeed see that it's uh, it's very similar in across mammals to what we see in human. We see three endogenous processes, so, so no really clear evidence of external mutagens causing mutations, but just kind of endogenous cellular processes. Um, but what's interesting is that although it's the same three processes, the relative contribution of those processes seems to vary across species. So in this kind of uh, kind of panel at the bottom, we have the three different processes uh, in green, orange, and purple. And we can see in mouse and ferret in particular, there's this large contribution, the percentage of mutations coming from uh, this SBSC, we call it, which is uh, it's kind of synonymous with the oxidative damage signature that we see in humans. So reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, we think, is particularly contributing towards mutations in mouse and ferret. Um, but interestingly, we don't see any new mutational signatures across mammals. It seems to be the same, same three processes contributing to mutations, but the, the relative proportion is varying. Um, but kind of ultimately what we wanted to do with this data set was to address well, we we see these different mutational burdens are they explained by any kind of life history traits or phenotypes across these species so we tested you know the, the effect of different variables on the rate the kind of mutation burdens that we saw uh, primarily using data from the anage database and also similar to the previous talk we use these species 360 longevity records from zoos to establish the maximum lifespan of these different species and you know, the really striking observation that we found was that somatic mutation rates seem to scale uh, with lifespan across mammals in an inverse manner. So essentially, the, the kind of the take home message is that a human and a mouse, despite having vastly different lifespans, 
are ending their lifespan with a similar number of somatic mutations. So this, this 30 fold variation in lifespan across the species that we're studying, 40,000 fold variation in body mass, but the end of lifespan mutational burden is only threefold. Um, and you know, variation in lifespan is explaining about 80% of the variance in somatic mutational burden at the end of lifespan. Um, so this it was a striking result we weren't really expecting. We thought we'd see more of an effect of other variables like body size. Um, but actually, when you correct for lifespan, body size doesn't give any additional explanatory power to understand somatic mutation rate. So it really seems that lifespan is the driving factor for somatic mutation rate uh, across these mammalian species. And kind of one really clear example of that is if you compare the giraffe and the naked mole rat, you know, they have an enormous variation in body size, but they have the same lifespan, essentially, and their somatic mutation rate is almost identical. So it really seems that it's lifespan, not body size. Um, and so this raises an interesting question for understanding Pedo's paradox, because to some extent, yes, this suggests that maybe the longer lived animals do seem to have a lower mutation rate. But we, we would expect if it was somatic mutation rate that was solely explaining or solving Pedo's paradox, we'd see an additional effect of body size. You know, if all these mammals were the same size, uh, maybe not, but we know that giraffes, uh, elephants are much larger. And at least in giraffe, uh, which is the largest species we have, we don't see any additional reduction in mutation rate due to the larger number of cells that they have. Um, so this suggests that there must be other mechanisms, at least in large bodied organisms that have evolved to reduce their cancer incidence. Uh, and as was mentioned in the previous talk, this could be, as, as has been shown in elephants through increased copy numbers of TP53, or perhaps, perhaps they don't have a lower mutation rate, but they have increased sensitivity to DNA damage. So when there are proliferative cells, the immune system is able to detect them or, or remove them. But I think it, it kind of take home message is that we haven't completely yet solved Peter's paradox. There's still a lot to learn about how these large bodied species are reducing their cancer incidence and whether there's a shared mechanism across species or whether each large bodied species has kind of solved it in a different way, I think is a fascinating question. Um, and just finally, where we're going with this research in the future is, you know, we've only looked at 16 mammalian species and there's a lot more species out there. So we're trying to extend this work to look across the animal kingdom uh, as, and beyond the animal kingdom to also look at plants. Uh, but you know, to address these kind of lifespan and cancer questions, we're particularly interested in certain species. Uh, just one example would be um, you know, ant colonies where you have a queen that can potentially live 30 years, but a worker that's only living one or two years, yet they share the same genome. So what's going on there? Does the, has the queen got better DNA repair mechanisms? Do they have a slower mutation rate or is that actually not important for you know, aging and insects? So I, we're hoping by casting this comparative net even wider, we'll be able to better address and answer some of these questions. Um, uh, yeah, and with that, I'd just like to thank yeah, many of the people who are involved and made this study possible, and really looking forward to a discussion about uh, all of this, uh, this work that's been presented. Well, Alex, thank you very, very much. That was outstanding. Um, I do see some questions, or uh, at least a couple have popped up in the chat box, and I think Meredith and I will try to keep track of them and let people raise their hands, but if I can Go ahead and uh, take advantage of just two quick questions. First, one for Orsha and then one for Alex. So Orsha, for you just, and I guess they're related questions, you guys can approach them, is Orsha, how important do you suppose survivorship curves are in explaining some of the differences, say, between ungulates and uh, carnivores, where in the wild, carnivores tend to get broken much earlier in life and don't make their full lifespan. And then, or before that, Alex, you can start kind of contemplating this with that. Um, how important too is that you are just measuring the mutations you can see that are extant. How many mutations happen that actually got weeded out? And so there's the real mutation rate and then there's the uh, mutation rate that, that remains. Um, Orsha? Yeah, so I think it's extremely important. And I think the massive uh, increase, massively increased cancer risk in carnivorous animals is, is partly because they live much longer in zoos than they would be, they are supposed to in nature, simply because a, an old carnivore is unable to hunt, unable to, to find food. And in zoos, we keep them artificially as long as they, they bodies hold together. So it's, I think it's definitely a major factor in influencing their risk of cancer. Thank you. Um, Alex? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, so we did look for evidence of kind of selection, negative selection in these cell populations. And, and in, in human, that's been done you know, with more samples. And it seems that in, in terms of somatic evolution, it seems there's not a strong, strong evidence of negative selection, really, genome population-wide weeding out mutations. So these, these cell populations seem quite tolerant to non-synonymous, you know, uh, stop, gain of stop, loss of function mutations. 
Um, so we think we have a pretty good estimate of the somatic mutation rate. And there's not a lot of evidence that we're missing mutations because of, for example, negative selection weeding them out. There seems these cell populations are, are quite tolerant. But of course, it, it could be that we, there are cases where a mutation just can't be tolerated and, and they're removed from the population. Oh, excellent. Thank you. I think, Sudindra, looks like uh, you managed to uh, get our first questions in the chat. Can I invite you to unmute and go ahead and uh, share them uh, to our speakers? Hi, yes. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Great. No, fascinating talks. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad I managed to make it today. Um, so I was just curious when you talked about the C to T uh, mutations, and that's typically how CPG sites turn to TPA sites. And I was wondering if that was uh, specific. You, you, did you see that those were enriched for your the mutations or were you talking about um, C to T outside of CPG islands? No, no, it, no, you're right. It tends to be a CPG site. So that we see that as a dominant, one of the most common mutational processes. It's present in all, in all human cell types that we've looked at, but it seems particularly prevalent um, in uh, rapidly dividing cell types. So we think that maybe it's that kind of damage is more like, those kind of mutations seem more likely to occur in, in very proliferative cell types, but we even see it in neurons and, and post-mitotic cells. So it seems to be an ongoing process of mutagenesis in, across all cell types. Right. The reason I asked that was the CPG sites being more prone to mutation seems to me somehow benign uh, because it's so prevalent. Uh, so I was wondering if that needed to be taken into account uh, as a routine kind of mutation, especially in mammals that uh, perhaps are more benign. And I don't know how you would necessarily test that, but it seemed to me that those would be probably a little more, little less dangerous than uh, other C to T uh, mutations, which is why I was uh, wondering about that. I, I squeeze in another question, and I thought I might, I might as well ask that now. Um, when you talked about lifespan, the first thing, of course, I thought of was tortoises. And, and, and I, I can't remember if you included them in your study and if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, so two, two great questions. So the first one, yeah, um, about how benign different types of mutations are. So yeah, we certainly think the majority of these mutations we're observing are kind of neutral. They're not really affecting cellular phenotype. Um, but certainly there are different mutational processes that are more or less likely to kind of lead to carcinogenesis, probably, you know, once it cause double strand breaks, kind of catastrophic chromothripsis events. Uh, so yeah, we do think that this is generally kind of just like a clock. It's tracking age in the cell and these mutations occur, but most mm -hmm. of them are not, not deleterious for the cell. Uh, and secondly, yes, we are, I'm currently working to try and get my hands on some samples from tortoises, giant tortoises, these longer lived species, because yeah, to address the lifespan question, there's better groups than mammals to, to look at this. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. We have a question here for Diana Sharon. I think for her it was easier to have it read out. So if I can read it on her behalf, what do the comparative data show with regard to the reproductive strategy, for instance, litter size? Uh, yeah, I can start with that one then. Uh, so we, we looked at litter size as well. Um, it had some explanatory power, but not as much as lifespan, we think, because they're correlated. The problem is once you get to a certain lifespan, the litter size tends to be one. So we kind of lose some resolution there where that you gain. When you look at lifespan, it's kind of, it, it, it keeps continuing. But at some point, once lifespan seems to be long enough, you don't, you can't really distinguish between longer and shorter lifespans using litter span. Um, so I think we have a question from Stephen Stearns. Did you want to unmute and dive right in? Yeah, can you hear me all right? Absolutely. You look great, too. Um, I'm puzzled by a recent paper in American Naturalist from a Chinese group that uh, did a large-scale genomic analysis of cetacea. And uh, they were looking for genes that have been looked at uh, in other contexts as identifying either increased or decreased risk of cancer. And they looked across the increase in body size in whales, uh, starting, of course, from ungulate ancestors. And uh, what they found, which really puzzled and surprised me, is that the larger whales' genomes are enriched for genes that place them at greater risk of cancer rather than less. And they came up with uh, the idea that this supported a hypertumor hypothesis. The, uh, the hypertumor hypothesis is that 
cancers are kept under control by other cancers. In other words, if you get up to a high enough rate of production of cancers, the, the competition among them controls them. And I, it's a creative idea, but I'm puzzled by it because it seems to me that you have to go through kind of a fitness valley to get to that. In other words, if you're doing this, then at some point in your evolution, you're just dealing with a hell of a lot of cancer. And so I'd be curious to know whether any of the others in the audience uh, have read the paper and have been as puzzled by it as I am and what your thoughts are. Portia, do you have a thought on that? Do you want to jump in? I have to confess, I have not seen the paper. Yeah, I'm familiar with the idea and uh, it's, it's extremely puzzling. I think Mathieu can talk more about this if he wants to dive in. I think it's a very interesting idea, but uh, uh, similarly to you, I, I am puzzled how it could work and how these super tumors are not, not interfering with basic, uh, basic functioning of the body. So yeah, I haven't read enough uh, about this idea actually too. Yeah, to Alex, do you want to just give a yay or nay? I, I think I completely agree with the comments they've already said, like great idea, but yeah, you know, hard to imagine how, how that evolved, but great, interesting concept. Yeah, so, so Stephen, I can just make one comment. We're doing experiments with squamous cell carcinoma and naked mice um, caused by UV. And after three months of UV and about 40, 50 days, these guys get seven to eight different independent originations of cancer, skin lesions on their skin. And um, I can certainly say that, yes, over time, some of those lesions will kind of merge and they will sort of form competition. But by that point, the mouse is in such a bad way, it is not going to say, wow, this is so great. I've got three lesions here so that only one giant one takes over and kills me. That's got to be satisfying. Um, anyway, well, thanks. Um, Matthew, thanks so did you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with what uh, Australia said. But um, what I can add is the fact that I think uh, when uh, um, the few whales that have been through a necropsy, I think uh, not a lot of tumors have been found. So, except in, uh, uh, in Canada for this uh, really polluted site where most of the whales had, um, had some tumors, but it was really explained by carcinogenic uh, exposure. Um, but all the, normally whales, uh, when they go through necropsy, we do not find many, many tumors. So, I, I will, yeah. And <laughs> maybe, maybe fact, more uh, of, it may be more of a comment on the difficulty of genomic analyses in a phylogenetic context than it is actually yeah. on what, whether, whether or not whales die of cancer. Thank you. I think we have a question from Vincent Lynch, if you would like to unmute and, and jump in. Hi, great talks. Um, I was mostly curious for Alex, how general you think the somatic mutation rate is across cell types. In other words, might different cell types which have different embryological origins have different somatic mutation rates? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I think we can only really address that in, in human. Um, and yeah, we, we do see quite very extreme variation in well, somatic mutation rate, depends how you define extreme, but so the highest we see really is kind of uh, intestinal crypts or appendix crypts where we see about 80 mutations, 40 to 80 mutations a year, and then it goes right down um, post mitotic tissues like muscle uh, neurons, where you, I think you're talking like looking around 10 mutations a year, and, it, and then in, in the germ line, the protected cells like the oocyte or the spermatogonial stem cells there, we're only seeing like one or two mutations a year, so there's quite a lot of variation. I don't think uh, it it clearly is, can be explained by the embryological origins of the different cell types. Um, but that's something that people are, are looking into, kind of doing these phylogenetic trees of development and trying to understand that. So I don't know if we have a definitive answer on that. But it is, it is striking. There is quite significant variation. Uh, you know, we thought it would all be explained by cell division rates, but it seems not to be. I mean, we see these processes of somatic mutation happening in post-mitotic cells as well, just at slightly lower rates. Um, so I think there's still a lot to understand about this variation across cell types. Thanks. I'm curious, did you see that there was a correlation between how transcriptionally active those cell types might be? Because there's transcription coupled DNA damage that happens too. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if we've looked at the uh, overall transcriptomic patterns, but we do see certain signatures that are related to transcription coupled damage or repair. Uh, and so, so often like in a tissue that highly expresses a certain gene like insulin uh, in the liver, you see uh, this pattern of they tend, those regions of the genome, those genes tend to have more mutations than other regions. So there's some in increased damage 
uh, which could have implications for aging, we think, because, you know, if certain cell types really need to produce something and that tends to be getting mutated, that could have potentially some negative impact over the lifetime. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to move to some of our raised hands. So Ed Legrand, if, if you'd like to uh, share your thoughts and question. Well, in regard to the, actually the last question that intestinal epithelial cells have high mutation rates, um, that would, that's exactly what I might have expected because a uh, mutation there isn't going to matter much. These cells are, you know, sloughed off in a few days. Likewise, skin epithelial cells, uh, if there's a defect in those, they're just going to fly right off in, in a week or in a couple of weeks. Um, so in that sense, it seems like uh, the mutations may be there all the time, but in some cell types, there's no need to spend much effort to correct them. So that's my thought on that. If I can just jump in for just a moment, I think what's, of course, really interesting when we raise some of these, you guys have touched upon it, <clears throat> is that fascinating question of tissue dependent cancer rates, where there's, of course, been debate, <clears throat> you know, in the literature as to whether it's entirely random. You've seen some of those as to tissue specific insult specific. So on that question, I think the broader question then of the role of tissue specific, uh, maybe Matthew, do you, do you want to jump in? Because not only have you seen it across all the different mammals, you've seen it in all the different tissues. Well, the database that we are using, we do not know actually um, uh, which organ developed cancer. So it's difficult to uh, discriminate between tissue. Um, as uh, Australia mentioned, maybe uh, uh, we are trying to get access to a new database where we can look at uh, cancer in different tissue and then we can probably investigate this kind of yeah, question. Portia, Alex, did you want to comment on that or we can certainly move to the next question? Yeah, I just a quick comment there. I think, yeah, you know, the study that I was involved in, we were mainly looking at normal healthy tissue. But I think what would help kind of address a lot of these questions is more sequencing of cancers in wild animals, so understanding, you know, are they oncogenically driven or what are the causes? And that will really help us maybe on a, not a really useful angle for trying to understand this solution to Peter's paradox. Right. Um, Portia, any thoughts on tissue specific? Yeah, I think it's it must be related to, to the rate of proliferation of these cells. So uh, I was reading that brain cancer is mostly originating from glial cells because neurons uh, do survive the lifespan of, uh, of, of the host. And uh, there is very rare, mostly inherited mutations that cause brain cancer in the neurons. So uh, given that they do not divide, they cannot accumulate much mutation. So. I guess, uh, yeah, it must be related, but it, it's it's up to, up to our next projects to investigate this. Right, right. Um, there's been a question that's kind of way up in the comments, so I just want to be able to get to it. Uh, Sorrel Fitzgibbon, would you like to jump in and ask your question? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it's already been answered a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can uh, say anything about the mechanisms that keep the mutation rate low in the germline. I imagine there's a lot known. Uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm, I, th I think there's still a lot we don't understand about. Uh, I'm really fascinated by this really low mutation rate we do observe in the germline. Um, particularly, I've, so I've been involved in some work looking at spermatogonial stem cells, and there we see it's striking to us because sperm, you know, it needs to be so proliferative to generate the amount of sperm that's produced in a mammal's lifetime, but we see really low mutation rates much lower than any of the other tissues in the body that we've looked at. So we suspect one part of it is that maybe there's this, uh, and it's been, you know, other studies have shown this basal population of kind of semi-quiescent spermatogonial stem cells that are not dividing very frequently. You know, they divide every maybe once or twice a year or less, uh, and then they go back to being quiet and maybe focusing on repairing, keeping the DNA kind of protected. So you have transiently proliferative daughter cells. Um, but even that, you know, doesn't seem, isn't really satisfactory as a complete solution. So we wonder if there's, just a better DNA repair program that's activated there. That there may be studies I'm not aware of, and I'd love to hear about them, but I, I, I don't really know what that solution is to that. And I think understanding that would be fascinating to understand you know, if some cells can maintain such a low mutation rate, why isn't it being done across the cell types? And is it just because the soma doesn't matter that much from an evolutionary perspective? Um, but yeah, I think it's a fascinating question. I see that Michael Hockbird has his hand up. Please, Michael, good to see you. Yes, hello. <clears throat> Question for Alex. So I, I'm just wondering, 
in addition to these you know, concerns about different mutation rates across different tissues, how much rich data do you have across the different ages? So what I'm thinking is you would expect perhaps stronger selection against mutations younger in life. Um, and this would, would be kind of supportive of James De Gregori's idea of adaptive oncogenesis, where it's actually aging tissues that are key in predicting uh, cancers later in life. Um, and so, you know, what we see is this linear increase in somatic mutations in the tissue that you looked at, but how were you able to look in some detail in younger individuals um, to really see if there's some kind of signal of the predicted lower mutation rates? Yeah, so I would say we did, probably didn't have the power to really do that well in the animal data, but there's, there's quite rich data sets for humans now. And as far as I'm aware, we do see this, um, it's, it's pretty linear, the accumulation of somatic mutations with age. There isn't a huge amount of data for very young in life, I would say, but there are, there are studies working to kind of fill in those gaps. But so far, I, from my knowledge, it's, it does seem pretty linear across tissues. But I think, you know, we do often, we do occasionally see outliers and it'd be great to have richer data sets and see if there's some patterns there that we're missing. Okay. So, uh, Sudhir um, Kumar, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, hey, that's a wonderful talk. Uh, thanks for sharing these wonderful results. Uh, I, you know, from looking at the long-term history and germline, which some people talked about, we know that neutral evolutionary rates, which is what you can estimate among species, are not 20 or 30 times different between humans and mice, you know. A mouse versus rat versus human versus chimpanzee. The rate difference may be like two times, but it's not like 20 times, 30 times we expect uh, between the two. And to explain that, you know, 20 years ago, uh, it sort of became clear to many of us that the, uh, the damage to the cell, uh, to the to chromosomes while in the sitting phase in uh, long lived, uh, I mean, not long lived, I mean, the ones, the species with the, you know, long generation time, there must be a difference between the CPG damage, which is a lot of damage that happens while you are in the static phase versus transcriptional error, which happens when you incorporate the error and you create new errors. And so that interplay will be very different. So what I was interested, what I liked was what you did was you found that to be the case. The signature quantity changed based on how long, uh, the, the, how much of the longevity was. So it seems like you might actually have the same process making rates very similar between species over long history in germline as it is in the tissues uh, working on the somatic evolution side. And so I think from that perspective, it seems like there's a lot of similarity. Uh, and so, so did you think about that problem while, while doing this and how to, to, discuss, to unite germline versus somatic change uh, similarity? Yeah, so, yeah, so it's a great points and, and, and yeah, uh, nicely put. Um, yeah, so I, I, what we're currently doing is just to, is we're trying to generate now data sets from germline cells and somatic tissue from the same animals or species different lifespan to do that direct comparisons, kind of sequencing uh, sperm or spermatogonial stem cells and oocytes at single molecule level and comparing that to somatic tissues and see if we see those same trends that are kind of recapitulate, does it recapitulate what we see in phylogenetic trees between species in the direct germline sequencing. So it's something we really want to look into more over the, the coming years. So time Great. is beginning to run out, but I'd like to invite Orisha first and then Matthew, if you have one final word of wisdom you'd like to lead, leave with this very eminent and diverse group of evolutionary biologists and scientists. Yeah, I think, um, I know. Just, uh, just try to study cancer outside of humans, I would say, to most, most people, because I think it's, there are so many exciting things to, to find there, both mechanisms and, and just the overall patterns and conservation concerns and medical uh, applicability. So I think I would just urge people to, to really look into it and, and try to do work, work at it. Well, thank you. Matthew, do you have a last uh, thought you'd like to leave with us? Yeah, I'm just I'm just really glad that so many people <laughs> came here today to uh, to listen uh, these two talks and um, and that so many people are actually interested by these questions uh, because it's kind of uh, it's not a new topic but we are getting more and more data to answer this question and to study these questions. So I'm I'm really glad that so many people 
uh, got in touch with. And um, and um, and I think I need to speak with Alex more. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. I do, yeah. do want to thank all three of you as really awesome scientists, having had the pleasure of looking over, uh, you know, stalking your research gate and Google Scholar. I'm just really impressed with the diversity and the quality of the work, including the two papers that you had to read. At this point, I'm sorry we did not get all to all the questions. It could certainly keep going on, but Meredith, I, I, I think you can probably uh, bring us in for the conclusion. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Alex really quickly to see if he has any uh, final thoughts he'd like to share, and then I'll close us out. Alex? Yeah, well, again, just to echo what the other speakers have said, it's been great to see so much interest. And I think it's a really exciting, uh, going to be exciting next few years for this field with the kind of new technologies we have to apply to these questions. And there's still so many kind of fundamental biology unresolved questions in this field that we can now start to address. And, and the comparative approach and combining the kind of cancer studies, the lifespan studies and how those fit together, I think is going to be fascinating. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like this conversation could go on for at least another 30 minutes uh, with the questions that we, we have in the, the chat and that keep coming. But we are at the top of the hour, so I want to thank you all again for joining. Before we close out, I wanted to quickly share uh, the Club Ev Med website here, which you should be seeing on my screen now. This is the great uh, couple talks that we just heard. And then we do have our final Club Ev Med of the summer next week, next Wednesday at uh, noon Eastern time. And this is the normal and the pathological revisited with Paul Griffiths. So we're going to be talking about kind of how we classify what is disease and what is pathology. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to be our final Club Ev Med of the summer. We'll be taking a break in July and August. We'll be back in September. So do join us next week for our last event of the summer. And with that, I'll thank you all for attending. And uh, I'll send out a link to the recording soon and hope to see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.